and welcome back to Rewild Ology, the show about conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. Before we dive into today's episode, I have more announcements for you all that I'm so pumped to share. All of you know that I absolutely love this podcast and the new connections that have been created since it launched. However, I'll be fully honest with you all that sometimes I feel like I'm releasing these episodes into a black hole with no way to chat with you about it. So I decided to change this and I created a Facebook group called Rewildologist as a place for all of us to come together and talk about conservation in an open and engaging way. Since you, listener, could easily be anywhere in the world, I chose Facebook as the group platform so that anyone anywhere can join. I also plan to use this group as a space to ask questions, make podcast announcements, share interesting resources that I find, et cetera. And I encourage everyone in the group to do the same. No more sharing Rewildology stuff into the black ethers. (laughs) You can easily find the group by either searching for Rewildologist or heading over to the Rewildology Facebook page and clicking on the groups tab. And of course, I will have a link in the show notes for you as well. I hope to see you there soon, everyone. All right, and on to today's show. I know you've heard the age-old saying that dogs are man's best friend. Well, what if they're also conservation's best friend? This week and next week, we're exploring dogs' emerging roles in conservation, specifically in data detection and anti-poaching. In this episode, I'm speaking with Kayla Fratt, professional dog trainer, podcast host, blogger, entrepreneur, and founder of Canine Conservationist. In other words, she's a total badass independent woman making her way through this crazy field. (laughs) Kayla does a fantastic job taking me through her journey that led her to today, the different types of conservation dog jobs that are currently out there, why she decided to go into conservation detection dog work, and all of the ups and downs she's experienced along the way. If you're a dog person, like to stay up to date on the latest conservation methods, or need some inspiration to keep trucking along your path, you'll definitely want to listen to everything Kayla shares. I learned so much from her, and I'm sure you will too. Also, you're going to hear Kayla and I have a total brain fart over a type of animal tracking that's called a plaster track casting. (laughs) I decided to give you this information now instead of interrupting you later. Trust me, you'll know when this is relevant because we both stumble for a solid second not finding the words for this procedure. So here it is. (laughs) And of course, if you like today's episode, share it with a friend, put it on your Instagram story and tag Rewildology or put it anywhere else that you like to share your favorite podcasts. Also give the show a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or in another app that allows you to review shows. Subscribing and reviewing the show is the best way to help more and more people organically find the show. All right, everyone. And now on to my conversation with Kayla. Awesome, Kayla. Thank you so much for coming on Rewildology. We're going to have so much fun today. We have our drinks ready to go. It's mm-hmm. happy hour and we're just going to talk about some conservation dogs. So this is sweet. So before we get to today, you mm-hmm. have... The perfect story of somebody who was at the right place at the right time. I don't know how this has happened in your life, but it's amazing. So let's explore that. Let's go back in time. Let's go to your childhood and all of these amazing puzzle pieces that came together to lead you to who you are today. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks again for having me on. Um, I'm super excited to be here. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Like there are so many things in my childhood and then even leading up into my young adulthood that I've had so far where I've just been in the right place at the right time. And um, so, and that even starts with like literally who my parents are. So I was born in Colorado. My dad is a conservation biologist, wildlife biologist, um, kind of specializing in fisheries and forestry. Um, And my mom is a writer, kind of communicator, fundraiser. Um, And both of those threads are going to become very apparent as we go through my story. Um, And then I was raised in Wisconsin. So born in Colorado, raised in Wisconsin. My parents bought this little 40 acre um, kind of derelict farm when I was a kid. Um, And we moved there when I was four or five. And um, 40 acres and had been logged. It had been used as a dairy farm for a while. And then it was just kind of being sold as like, you know, the barns are falling down. No one really does like small family farms in Northern Wisconsin anymore. So it's just a property now. 
And so throughout my childhood, I spent a ton of time playing with animals and like just hanging out on the farm. I was like training my chickens to come when called and I had homing <laughs> pigeons and, and all of that. But then at the same time, um, I was always like trying to impress my dad, basically, as many little kids who uh, uh, like idolize their parents do. And my dad being a conservation biologist, one of the best ways that I could like kind of get his attention and do stuff together was that he would send me out on these like community science projects, <laughs> projects as I was a little kid. So he would like send me off and be like, if you bring me like three dragonflies, we can preserve them and pin them tonight. So like I was a little kid learning how to like A, go out with these like massive like actual technical dragonfly nets not like a kid's bug nets but like the, 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 <laughs> From the kind that entomologists would use <laughs> that's amazing it was like as big as i was it was preposterous <laughs> and and i was like learning to like use kill jars and preserve and pin dragonflies and like i still have some of those displays to this day um and then simultaneous to that my dad got a grant to restore the wetlands on this property. So when it had been logged, the wetlands had also been trained. And when I was in about fifth grade, my parents um, got this grant and um, a company came out. I don't remember many of the details of this because again, I was in fifth grade, but they re they dug out these wetlands again. And so throughout my childhood, I got to see these trees that my dad and I transplanted over to, to the ponds and these ponds fill with wildlife. Um, and just two years ago now was the first time we had sandhill cranes come and nest there. No so a lot of- way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh like, my yes gosh. way. <laughs> That's so I, special. I mean, we had Sora's come and nest there. It was just incredible. And I would just like spend my summers wearing my dad had got me these like little kid waiters and I would just like go tromp around the ponds and he would get, he gave me a photo one year. Um, it was like an aerial photo of the property and asked me to map every single bird nest on the property. So I spent like all summer and like looking back, my dad was just trying to get me out from under his feet, <laughs> yeah. but he also was like totally putting me through like field biologist boot camp as like an eight year old. <laughs> But get out of them under my feet. You're actually like, this is really fun. <laughs> yeah, and I was just like, cool. Okay, I, I love this. You know, and like my younger sister was much less outdoorsy and she was just like coloring and like doing normal kid things. And I was just like, I'm going to be a lepidopterist. Tromping <laughs> like, around in the mud. Um, so yeah, that was my childhood. It was really, really, um, like I, I describe it as very idyllic in in um, in retrospect. Um and yeah, I was just like totally obsessed with conservation biology and ecology and animal behavior, which are, you know, passions that continue on through this day. Um, I also like extracurricularly was very into cross country skiing. Um, so spent a lot of time skiing in the winters, which is great because you can't do much with dragonflies or bird nests in the winter. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and then kind of going forward. So the part of Wisconsin that I grew up in is really rural um, and pretty under underserved. It's just one of those communities that it had a high, really high teen pregnancy rate, really high alcoholism rate. Um, and I was pretty bored and felt kind of trapped in my hometown a lot of the time. Um, so what happened was my, my sister was sick for quite a bit of my high school career. She had MRSA. Um, and so my parents were really focused on taking care of her, which was really important to our family, but also left me really um, to my own devices a lot. And that led me to be able to go um, and take my entire junior year off college. So the reason I mentioned Nordic skiing earlier is I actually had the incredible fortune. This is like the next like good fortune, right place, right time sort of thing that happened in my life. I was at the American Bergabiner, which is a 50 kilometer cross country ski race. It's like a 50 K long party. It's insane. <laughs> the people drink. Um, it's so fun. Like 10,000 skiers from all around the world come to Hayward, Wisconsin to compete in this race. It's the largest ski race in Northern Wisconsin. And anyway, I was there, I was at the expo. I was going to compete in the Corte Lopet that year, which is the, the half distance. So, you know, you've got a marathon, you've got a half marathon, you've got the Bergabiner, you've got the Corte Lopet. And I was just wandering around the expo, you know, picking up all my free stickers and putting my name in all the raffles and all that stuff. And I wandered up to this booth for conserve school. And I had heard of it before, actually. Um, and it was it's a boarding school in northern Wisconsin. And what I don't think I realized at the time was that the four-year boarding school was closing down and they were transitioning over to a semester plan program, which means that high schoolers can take a semester off of their normal high school program and come and study at conserve school. And conserve school was, unfortunately, so the school closed down in 2020, um, but they were incredibly focused on environmental stewardship. That's really their thing. Um, 
it is on a 1500 or 1400 acre campus. Mm. So just a massive campus, um, never been logged Northern Wisconsin. So it's just these huge old hemlock trees and bogs and just like, I mean, it's just an amazing place. So anyway, I ran into the admissions officer at this ski event and he talked it up to me. I applied. Um, I believe their application closed like the next week or like four days later or something ridiculous like that. So I just threw together my application. I ended up getting in. And then the incredible thing, because it was their very first year in existence, they were offering these like preposterous scholarships. So I basically went for free. I want to say it was 500 bucks for the semester, all of our field trips and all of our food and room and board and books. Like we're, um, you know, like my parents saved money by sending me there. And again, because my sister was sick, they they were able to kind of focus on her a little bit more, which I'm sure was really helpful to them in retrospect. That's probably, again, part of the reason they let me go. Mm-hmm. I think my parents were always incredibly supportive of me being like an independent kid. But I think the fact that they had so much on their plate with my sister probably helped. So yeah, that was conserve school. And it was just, I mean, I spent the semester, like our gym class was like mountain biking and fire building and all of these just absolutely incredible things. Um, and it so really jealous. got me started. <laughs> yeah, it was, I mean, I'm jealous of 16 year old me. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was definitely my introduction into like activism as well. And like conservation, like we had one of our classes was like history of wilderness exploration, which also talked about a lot of like native cultures and things, you know, not just colonizers, luckily, um, not as much as maybe it would now, but, um, but we talked about all these things and we had a history class. One of our lectures was just all on the difference between preservation and conservation and like, it, it just introduced me to this world in a really intense academic way at a really young age. That was just incredibly um, lucky for me and eye-opening. And then um, basically, so I did my first semester of my junior year there. And then I was like, okay, what do I want to do for my second semester of junior? I don't really want to go back and like have to join my U.S. history class halfway through the semester. And I just had this incredible semester doing all of these great things and meeting all these amazing people. And it was like the first time in my life that I felt like I belonged I don't want to go back to like normal high school. Um, So I applied for AFS, which is the American Field Service. And that's um, a study abroad program, again, geared towards high schoolers. My family had actually hosted AFS students in the past. um, And my high school had a very, very active exchange student program. Um, So that probably helped me get in. I applied and was accepted to go to Panama. And then this is like the next, just like a random stroke of luck. This And this one is like like my who my parents are like a true stroke of luck conserve school like obviously I also took some initiative there but Panama for whatever reason I got randomly placed in the province of Bocas del Toro which is just this like spectacularly beautiful province um and it happens to be the home of one of the few agriculturally based schools in Panama. So in Panama, you have kind of broad majors in high school. You could, like, you could have like economics or foreign relations or agriculture or English or language. Um, and so my school there was actually like a working farm school. So I got, again, this like amazing experience of like learning to herd goats with Rottweilers and like removing kutsu with the goats um, and like growing plantains and harvesting maracuya and all sorts of amazing stuff. Um, and that's just a cool experience that I had. I, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, it was really relevant to me in that it got me, I, I, I f- fell in love with the tropics there and fell in love with like feeling really comfortable traveling independently there. Um, and it was, it was a really intense experience. Um, I spoke pretty good Spanish at the time, but then I got there and like my host family didn't speak a lick of English, even like our English teacher at the high school, like barely spoke English. Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> so yeah, it was just a really intense, but really incredible experience. Um, and both of those experiences together, I think are what got me into Colorado college, which is a pretty selective liberal arts school. Um, that I went to for undergrad. And the main reason I fell in love with Colorado College and I went there is they're very field biology focused. Well, they're really field focused, not just, not just biology. They also have a really strong geology program. And that's because they work off of what's called the block plan. So the block plan is instead of, you know, your normal semester in undergrad, you might take three, four classes at a time. And, you know, those classes might meet for two hours, Monday, Thursday, Friday, or, you know, whatever it is. Um, 
with the block plan, instead what you do is you take four classes a semester, but you take them sequentially. So you take one class for three and a half weeks and that class meets for you know three to five hours a day, every day. Then you have a four and a half day weekend and then you start your next class and that goes on for the whole semester. So the really, really cool thing about that is you don't have other classes. So your ornithology class can take a nine day weekend to the Chiricahua Mountains to do owl mist netting, which is what mine did. Because okay. You're not going to, right. <laughs> like what? Because you're not going to miss any other classes. It's not like, oh, oh. shoot, I have like an English exam that, that week. Um, Forget and there's not, you know. Bleh. Yeah. Yeah. Or Orgo. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and then when you're in Orgo, like you're just like, I, I can't hang out with you. I'm in Orgo for the next month. I'll see you in, <laughs> exactly. I'll see you in three weeks. Uh, <laughs> Which out. is also nice. Like, yeah, you could just kind of like, I mean, like, yeah, when I was in Orgo, I just like went heads down for a month. It was just exactly. like, I will see all of you guys in a month. <laughs> Goodbye. I know my social life does not exist. It just doesn't just don't, don't even text me. I will be back later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I will see you after Christmas break. Exactly. Um, <laughs> And the other cool thing is you can take a month off of school. So I wrote a couple, um, my senior year, um, I just didn't take a class, my third block, which is so your third class um, of your first semester. Um, I just didn't take a class. I instead wrote a grant to go travel around um, the country and like go to a bunch of different national parks and just kind of explore. Um, and that's something you can do because I, I just, I missed one class. So I just had a light semester versus obviously if you took a full month off of like a semester program school, you would run into run into some issues. Big problems. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I studied abroad again. <laughs> so I went off to Ecuador with the Boston University Tropical Ecology Program, which is an incredible, incredible program. You're based out of host families in Quito, but then you take, you take a tropical ecology class, then you take a tropical montane ecology class, and you spend a bunch of time up in the Andes doing plant surveys at different altitudes and all sorts of stuff like that. Then you do tropical coastal ecology. You go down to the coast near Manta um, and then out to the Galapagos and spend a couple of weeks in each of those places, which is just incredible. Like, I'm so lucky to have been to the Galapagos. It's such a, a oh my God, what a ridiculous place. Right. Um, <laughs> and then you spend a month down in the Amazon at the Tiputini Biodiversity Research Station, which was just absolutely world changing. And during that time was the first time I heard about conservation detection dogs. So while I was in undergrad, I had been working as a dog trainer um, to pay the bills, basically. I had started my own dog training business as a freshman in college because I lost my work study and I was good at training animals and enjoyed that sort of work. Um, and I was continuing to pursue my degree in ecology. And I was running into the fact that like people would ask me, like, you really seem to like this dog training thing and you seem to be really good at it. You seem to be good at this entrepreneur thing. But I was like, no, 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 I want to be a conservationist. Like, I want to, I want to do something for the world more than just training people's dogs. And then I heard about this field of conservation detection dogs. And I was like, oh my God, I can do both. What the actual heck? Yeah. Um, you know, where has this been my whole life? Um, and, you know, so I did the thing that like every college student does. And I just like immediately sat down and wrote like 10 emails to everyone I could find in the field. And like eight of them didn't get back to me. One of them basically was just like, we're too busy goodbye. Um, and then one did give me um, advice, but that advice was still really discouraging. Um, they basically told me that they don't like hiring people with dog training experience because they like training people from the ground up. I was like, well, shoot, I'm 21 and I've already got supposedly too much experience for you. Like, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to lie on my resume about how much experience I have? I can't just like get a concussion and strategically forget, forget <laughs> how to train dogs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> nor do I want to. And the other thing they told me is that they didn't really like hiring people who were in committed relationships because the job was so field intensive that they ran into people having to choose between their partner and their job, which is probably discriminatory and not great, but also is pretty realistic um, on that part. Um, so I kind of shelved the idea of conservation detection dogs for a couple of years after that. Um, I graduated college and went off to work as a behaviorist at one of the largest animal shelters in the country and just kind of really dug into the dog training side of things. I was really, really invested in working with dogs. Um, and, uh, but I still always was kind of like, I think I want to go to grad school. I think I want to like do ecology, do conservation. Like I, I love the dog work. Um, and I, again, I'm good at it, but it just doesn't, it's not scratching that itch for me. I'm so invested in conservation. Um, 
So I wrote a Fulbright grant to go to New Zealand and study the selection and training of conservation detection dogs. I ended up being a finalist for the grant, but not receiving it. So I guess a semi-finalist perhaps. Um, but throughout that process, I got to know Working Dogs for Conservation, which is like the world's premier conservation detection dog organization. And I kind of was just picking their brains as I was writing the grant about problems that they had in their program and, you know, what what can we solve? What are some of the pain points in this industry so that I could tailor my grad school Fulbright proposal to, to what actually was needed in the industry? Um, and ultimately, they ended up hiring me. Um, they asked me to pull out of the Fulbright application process and gave me a job. So... I did finally get my foot in the door to be a conservation Ultimate detection win. dog handler. No grad mm. debt and a job in the field you want. Does this exist yeah. in life? <laughs> it was incredible. I it was and it was hilarious. Like in retrospect, there were there was a period of time where I was like, I don't know. I really want the Fulbright. I really want to go to grad school. Maybe I don't take this job. And my ex boyfriend was like, Kayla, come on. <laughs> this is the job you want to get after you go to grad school. Take it now. <laughs> Like, yes. why would you turn it down to go to grad school? And I was like, I, I mean, he was right. He was totally go right. Go ex-boyfriend. That was actually good advice. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a good one. He's a good yeah. egg. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, and I, I worked with them for about a year and a half. And then um, uh, about six months ago now, we parted ways. And I'm now um, running my own organization, Canine Conservationists, with just me and my two dogs. Um, so I'm back to the entrepreneur lifestyle. Um, which I'm really excited about. I'm super grateful for the education um, and mentoring that I got with Working Dogs for Conservation. It's just like a truly incredible company and organization to work with. Um, and I wouldn't be where I am now without them. So yeah, that's 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 me in a, a, a rather large nutshell. Yes. Before Before we dive in too much further, I think it is so funny, your story about how you got into dog training. So... Before we get any further, please just, just please share with everyone listening how the dog training actually came to be. Yeah. Yeah. So basically what happened when I when I first went to college, I had um, I had like a pretty complete um, financial aid package. I went to school almost for free, which was uh, incredible. I have very little student debt. And um I, at some point during like the first couple months of my freshman year, I was given another scholarship of some sort. I don't quite remember the details, but basically that caused the school to reevaluate my financial aid package and took away my work study. So I had money for like books and tuition, but I didn't have any money for like, you know, anything else. And like, Food, I was on meal plans, so I didn't have to pay for groceries, but like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you still like want things like you need money for like I don't know if I need to pay a friend back for gas or like buy a new computer or you know like whatever the heck it was like and even with the meal plan like you still have some snacks in your dorm room and those sorts of things so I needed money so I set up a Craigslist ad advertising myself as a dog walker um <laughs> it is a miracle I did not get murdered I spent so much time just like showing up at random people's houses as like an 18 year old kid just being like hi I'm here to walk your dog <laughs> It's amazing. Um, and uh and yeah so I I did that I started that and then like I don't know it probably took like two weeks of me being like okay walking dogs is boring everyone's dogs pull really hard on leash half of them bark at other dogs this is obnoxious so I started carrying treats with me and I started reading up on dog training and I just started training the dogs that I was being paid to walk and then another couple months into that I realized like wait if I'm just training the dogs, I should A, be charging more and B, should be advertising myself as a dog walker or a dog trainer instead of a dog walker. Um, and, and that, you know, then I was off to the races. I mean, I got really lucky as well with people um, giving me some really, really good books as like Christmas gifts or birthday gifts um, pretty early in my dog training career. Dog training is an entirely unregulated industry. And this is a bit of a tangent, but it's a PSA as well, for because I'm sure some of our listeners have dogs. Dog training is entirely unregulated. It is the wild west out there with dog training. And a lot of the odds are, if you know a famous dog trainer by name, they are full of it. Um <laughs> And they're just a celebrity. They don't actually know what they're doing. Like many fields, like if you look at the person who's on reality TV, supposedly representing the field, they're not actually doing the right thing. Mm, that's um, very interesting. And a lot of people, yeah. Um, and I just got really lucky um, for whatever reason, the people who are buying me books didn't buy me books from, um, I will name drop a couple that you would not want to go to. Um, Caesar Milan and Monks of New Skeet are both really old school, very outdated trainers 
Um, and I just got really lucky that instead I was given books by Jean Donaldson and Patricia McConnell and uh, Karen Pryor, who are all really science-based, really ethical, kind, effective trainers. Um, and uh, yeah, so I just got really lucky with that. And um, I do, I still absolutely love dog behavior and dog training. I'm really passionate about it. And I'm really passionate about doing it ethically, um, which I think kind of ties into a lot of my conservation interests. I'm really interested in non-invasive sampling, which is where conservation dogs can come in as a really useful tool. Um, but I'm also, it's really, really important to me as I'm working with my dog. My dog is my partner. You know, they're not just a tool. They're not just an instrument. They're not a camera trap that I'm going. I mean, and even we take good care of our camera traps. We don't just like chuck our camera traps in the bottom of our bag and throw them in the mud. Um, and the same goes for our dogs. So like my, you know, my number one concern pretty much every day is like making sure that my dog's needs are met and that I'm training them in a way that is clear to them. They know what their job is. They feel confident. They're ready to show up for work. They love work and work is never like scary or painful or frustrating for them as much as I possibly can, because obviously sometimes work is frustrating. I mean, there are times where I'm exhausted and frustrated too, of course, <laughs> but it is my job because my dogs didn't sign up for this. My dogs didn't ask for this job. They didn't apply for this job. I think that they would if they had the choice. But it is my responsibility to make it that way, which is a little different from like a boss with a human sort of relationship. Mm -hmm. So that was a little mm -hmm. bit of a tangent, but it is really, really important to me to think about. And that's not always the case in this field. There are a lot of canine handlers, both in conservation dog, a little bit less so in conservation stuff, but um, particularly in like the canine world of like bomb dogs and drug dogs it is a little bit more common to really view the dog as a tool. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, they're more than that. Yes, they're man's best friend, people. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Not just yeah. a tool. Not just a piece <clears throat> of burden. Awesome. So, so now, yes, we are back deep into conservation dogs. So the term conservation dog is quite a large field that is growing. Mm -hmm. So I'm very honored yes. that I'm partnering you with someone else who works in anti-poaching dog conservation. So both of you are conservation dog people, but very different. So very what different, exactly yeah. is it that you do? And mm -hmm. yeah, let, let's just dive into that. What, what's what's yeah, your conservation so our dog? tagline at Canine Conservationists is dogs detecting data. Um, oh, that's good. So, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, I thought of it on a run. That's where all my good ideas come from. Uh, and um, yeah, so basically, when I talk about conservation dog work, um, I think there's there's kind of three main pillars within conservation detection dog stuff. Um, there's a fourth if you kind of if you kind of want to want to put that in there. So we'll throw it in just just for fun. Um, so the first is anti poaching and wildlife crime sort of work, which I don't currently do. Um, but that can be either at like game preserves or national parks or ports of entry where you're screening either for like ammo or bushmeat or cat skins or ivory, those sorts of things. Again, I don't currently do that. Um, but working dogs for conservation, my former employer absolutely does, and it sounds like we've got a guest who does as well. The next is kind of endangered species monitoring or species monitoring. It can be done with an animal that's not endangered, but let's be honest, most of the funding goes to animals that are in peril. Um, so there are a lot of times what the dog is actually doing is finding scat. Um, so the other tagline that we occasionally use at can canine conservationists is sniffing scat for science. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, so it's usually scat. Sometimes the dogs are finding live animals. There are a couple really cool programs out there where the dogs are finding live turtles or turtle nests, or um, there is actually um, a, a gal named S. Esther um, who does uh, river Ryan rabbits in South Africa, just incredible work actually finding wow. the, the live rabbits. Um, she's amazing. <laughs> um, the next thing would be invasive species. So a lot of times there, you may be finding the scat of an invasive species to kind of determine presence or absence, like, hey, has have wild boar made it to this area or not? And a lot of times you're you're working with eDNA e there as well, so environmental DNA, where maybe um, someone has picked up something in the water that suggests that an invasive species is there and then the dogs are kind of coming in to check. That's, that gets a little technical. I don't do as much of that stuff yet. Um, eh, I've done some of it. Um, but then a lot of times you're actually just finding the actual invasive animal. Um, so that might be screening boats for zebra mussels, which is quite a bit of the work that my dog and I have done. Um, or it might be looking for searching for an invasive plant or something like that. And a lot of times what's really cool there is you'll have human searchers go through an area and pull all of the weeds that they can find. And then you send the dog team in after them 
to kind of clean up and find the little teeny tiny seedlings that he, the human searchers just don't have a chance in heck of finding like this two inch tall plant in the prairie where the, the plants are up to your hips. But the dogs can find it because it still smells. So that's the invasive species work. And then the last one, um, which I do do some of this as well, um, is a little bit more of kind of the biosecurity agriculture side of things. So there's quite a bit of stuff happening on the East Coast of the United States, working with like spotted lanternfly or powder, powdery mildew. So they're kind of, sometimes they're invasive species as well, but a lot of times they're actually related to agriculture. Um, and so it's kind of conservation related, kind of not. Um, I would say it's not really technically conservation quite the same way in a lot of those cases, but because it's the same programs and the same dogs, a lot of the times getting hired for it, it gets lumped in there. Nice. Thanks for breaking that down and like what that actually means. So I, I think the next logical question then is how does a dog get this job? How do you uh, select your dogs for this type of work? Yeah. So the first step generally is that I'm looking, well, the very first thing is like the first step is that the dog has to be like healthy and able to work. So that, you know, is kind of a given, but kind of not. So I, um, most of the organizations in this field, which is, this is really interesting. Most of the organizations in this field actually work with rescue dogs. Um, most people in this field do not like import working dogs from Belgium or something, which um, like a lot of our police forces in the U.S. do. So we're looking at, uh, at shelter dogs. So the first step is like, okay, is this dog young enough that this dog has enough career ahead of it that it's worth training this dog? So generally, you know, you're looking for a dog who's under four. Um, and then is this dog really healthy? Because if this dog has kind of bad hips, where like this dog might still be like a perfectly fine pet or even active pet, it's not really fair to ask a dog who may might have some amount of hip pain or elbow pain or whatever it is, do this sort of work because it is so physical and so intense. So, you know, again, that sounds like it should be a given, but a lot of times it's not. Um, so then the next step is looking at what we're generally looking for is a dog who is pretty over the top obsessed with toys. Um, and the reason we do that is that helps keep the dog's focus. While you can absolutely train a dog for this job with food, um, a lot of times for these really, really long searches where the dog has to work for hours and hours before they find their next target and gets get their reward the dogs who are kind of like pathologically obsessed with toys are the dogs who are kind of willing to work for to that level um the uh, and then on the flip side of it with dogs who do work for food sometimes if you're working in a really high find environment so say you're looking for something that you're actually finding something every couple minutes that dog could actually get full um and not want any more food <laughs> Oh, so the reward again, is like, I don't need anymore. To have dogs that do this for food, but what we look for um, generally is dogs who are over the top about toys. So I'm not talking about a dog who's kind of like, oh yeah, I'll play fetch with you. But like the dog who like is kind of always asking if they can play <laughs> and will keep, like if you throw the ball 10 times, they will ask for an 11th. Um, <laughs> and then once we've got a dog that we already know is really interested in toys, then we start kind of looking at whether or not that dog is willing to work for the toys and interested in searching because a huge part of this job is actually searching, not finding. So we need a dog who, you know, some dogs, they like absolutely love the toy, but as soon as you make it a little bit hard, they kind of give up or they just get frustrated or whatever it is. Um, so there, what we'll, we might do is we might take their favorite toy, we get them a little excited about it, and then we throw it into some really tall grass. So the dog has to actually kind of search for it. Or we put it up on a shelf or, you know, put it behind a bunch of chairs that the dog has to kind of like push through those chairs to go get the ball. And again, what we're just looking for is not only a dog who really has an interest in the toy, but actually has that interest and ability to push through adversity to go find that toy, which in dog training we call drive, um, is that the dog is actually willing to like work for that reward. Um, so generally from there, if that's starting to look a good, we're then all, you know, the whole time we're also kind of assessing temperament. One of the cool things about this job for rescue dogs in particular is that if you're just taking your dogs out to like Northern Idaho to find Puma scat, you can actually get away with a dog who maybe isn't comfortable with, with people or maybe isn't comfortable with other dogs. So dogs who might be incredible working dogs, but wouldn't be any good as a search and rescue dog or a bomb dog or something like that can actually succeed at this job because it's tends to be so remote and so solitary. 
That depends a little bit though. It depends on the size of the organization, whether or not they're able to absorb dogs like that into the organization, because most of the organizations, myself included, we do need a couple dogs that can do outreach events and demonstrations and go to conferences and be ambassadors. So for me personally, I am really looking for dogs that are incredibly outgoing, friendly, stable, confident, like good pet dogs, which is hard to find. Um, we kind of call our dogs unicorns. Like they're just, <laughs> they're, they're hard to find um, because like there are a lot of dogs out there, not a lot, but there are dogs out there who have the drive for this sort of work and could succeed at this sort of work, but wouldn't be any good as like demo dogs or outreach dogs. And if you're a larger organization, like working dogs for conservation, they absolutely can absorb those sorts of dogs. Rogue detection teams, I believe also is able to absorb those dogs because they've got multiple dogs. But for someone like me, I only have two dogs. So it's really important for me that I have, I have a dog, um, at least one dog. <laughs> that can like go with me to donor events or go demonstrate for school groups um, and kind of get the word out there and do fundraising because we are kind of a, we're a one woman, two dog show here. <laughs> yes, it's just so freaking amazing. You do everything. So inspiring. Yeah. So, so, okay. Uh, yeah. It's, it's tiring sometimes. Oh, I don't even know. I mean, you must sleep so hard every single night just with everything you do. Cause we have, we've only like scratched yes. the surface of like everything that you do. So, mm. We'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. We still got to learn more about dogs. Um, yeah, yeah. We say as we both take like a giant swig of our just drink. Like, <laughs> okay. We're going to drink. Okay. Next question. Why Ooh. are yeah. dogs so good for conservation? Yeah. Well, I mean, broadly, like, I'm not sure if pet dogs are good for conservation. I mean, right. I love dogs to death. Um, <laughs> But, <laughs> uh, you know, like dogs get in all sorts of trouble and they're disease vectors and all sorts of things. But so for conservation detection dog work, um, the first thing that I think about, because again, like, you know, as I, I uh, alluded to when I was talking about my history, like my dad's a biologist, my mom's like a communications outreach fundraising person. And one of the things that I love about working with conservation dogs is that they, they're a great outreach story. So if you're working with like an invasive plant, it can be really hard to get news outlets or grants or anyone to care about like this random invasive plant or even an endangered plant, you know, like people just, it, it's hard to get attention for a lot of stuff. And even when we're working with charismatic megafauna, a lot of times there just aren't happy stories or there aren't sightings of these animals. And it's hard to get people excited about them. But if you can get a conservation dog in there, it's a cute face. It's a happy face. You can get to talk about like, so my dog, Barley, um, he's seven now. I got him when he was three and a half. Um, I adopted him from a shelter. He was given up because his family was going through a divorce mm. um, and there was just, just a ton of turmoil and they just couldn't keep him anymore. And so he's just got this like this beautiful, happy story and his tongue is too big for his mouth and he <laughs> wags his tail so hard he hits himself in the face and he's just <laughs> achingly cute. Yes, it's all the door. And oh my God, he's, I mean, he's perfect in every way. I love him so much. Um <laughs> But, you know, so that's, that's awesome when we're out there and doing conservation work and like, it's hard work and like, it's discouraging and people are frustrated and land managers are annoyed with us, but then we've got this dog and it's just like, it's an amazing kind of connection point for like that, that human connection as well as, you know, money. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, like that's not always the first thing we talk about, but that is something that I find really fascinating about dogs. And then on the other side of things, dogs do generally get to be a non-invasive sampling um, procedure. Again, sometimes there are some projects where the dogs actually are going out and finding the live animals. So then it's not quite as non-invasive, um, but it's still potentially less invasive than like live trapping the animal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Darting the animal, all those things. Dart, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. I uh, I remember in my mammalogy class in undergrad, we were um we were talking to like a bighorn sheep biologist and they were talking about like chasing down these bighorn sheep in helicopters and trying to dart them. And then like sometimes the bighorn sheep just like ran off cliffs. Oh my being Jesus. Darted. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> like yeah, yeah, maybe maybe instead you train a dog to find their poop and then you can get the hormonal information from their poop instead of yes. trying to do a blood sample. <laughs> I mean, and obviously there are some things that you, you need blood for, you need the whole animal for, but like there's a lot of stuff you can do with poop. <laughs> a lot. I mean, it's coming from the animal, so... 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's a non-invasive sampling procedure, which is just really cool. Um, you know, if you're trying to go out there and like count wolverines, like good luck getting enough camera traps out there to actually find, um, get good tabs on wolverines. But if you get a dog out there, that dog can canvas the area because of how scent works. Scent also, like it moves through the landscape. So as you're moving, you don't have to be in the right place at the right time, which is huge. You know, camera traps and hair traps and paw, um, print tracks, whatever. The, what, what do you call when you like put plaster Paris out and you're trying to get the prints track? Traps? <laughs> I, just I don't know. Literally, I just literally <laughs> forgot myself. We'll look it up. We'll look it up. We'll look it up. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. People know what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, it was like a total those, like, like, like brain fart just pfft. it'll come to us in like 10 minutes um but you know all of those have to be right like now. in the ex oh god oh my goodness hello who's who is this why are you being a turd this is joplin um she is hello joplin you turd monkey why 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 are you doing this right now <laughs> just she was climbing on my desk and touching my microphone Okay, okay. We're we're gonna let you out. You're 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 gone. Okay, thank you. Anyways, anyways, I apologize. Keep going. <laughs> but anyway, so, anyways. So yeah, the, the the track traps or whatever they are, all of these things, they have to be in the exact right place. Like if your camera trap is oriented the wrong way, or if this animal like passes by a little bit too far away at night, or anything like that, you're out of luck. And you only get so much information from hair and tracks. You know, you might get presence or absence. Um, and same with camera traps. You you might be able to get individual ID with some of our, especially like our kitties, where we can look at, you know, patterns um, in their fur or whatever. But for a lot of animals, you might not be able to get individual ID from any of those, um, let alone like hormonal data. Right. Um, and dogs, because scent moves through the environment, my dog and I could be... 20 meters away from where an animal has pooped and my dog will be able to catch that odor, follow that odor over there and lead me to the spot where I can actually collect that sample. So that's really, really, really cool. Um, scent is just like, it gets a little trippy when I start trying to think about it too much yeah. because it travels in this way that just like our sight doesn't work the same way. It's not a good analog for how, how they perceive the world. Um, and then finally, one of the things that's really great about dogs is that they're mobile. They carry themselves. They're waterproof. They're dirt proof. They're really nice, hardy field partners, um, you know, versus having to lug around a bunch of camera equipment or telemetry or or whatever it is. Um, your dog can actually move themselves through the environment. Obviously, there are downsides, which I think we need to be honest about. Um, one of the things that can be tricky with dogs is, you know, they do get tired and they can and get injured, um, which obviously, you know, our camera traps can also get, you get busted up, but like I'm working on hopefully applying for a project to go down and study Jaguars in Ecuador in 2022. And my number one concern there is that my dog gets bitten by a snake. Mm. Um, because I don't, I can keep my eye out for snakes. I can put on snake proof boots. I can like do the things that like, hopefully will keep myself safe. There aren't snake proof boots for dogs. And I can't tell my dog, I can't explain to him how incredibly important it is that he does not step on a snake because we are six hours away from the nearest good veterinarian. Mm -hmm. So that's terrifying. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, especially again, because like I love my dogs with all my heart. Like the worst thing that could possibly happen would be something um, happening to one of my dogs out on survey. Um, and, you know, obviously we can take steps to prevent that. But so that's that's a downside of dogs. One of the other downsides of dogs is that um, they can, because they're so easily trained, it is so easy to teach a dog. Um, and, and, and I'm not saying this because I want people to go out in there and try this. Um, but once you know what you're doing, it is so easy to teach a dog how to find a new scent in exchange for their ball. It is also really easy to get a dog off target and accidentally train your dog to find something that you don't want them to find. Mm. Um so um, there's there's just like kind of countless examples in the field of people going out there and their dog maybe has been working for a couple hours. And the dog is kind of tired and the dog kind of guesses about something. And the dog is kind of like, hey, I know we were looking for Bobcat, but you want to know about this fox cat? <laughs> and then I want my ball. <laughs> yeah, I want my ball. I'm tired. <laughs> Give me my paycheck. And then the handler, because they don't know, sometimes like bobcat and foxcat can be pretty hard to tell apart visually, particularly if it's a little bit older um, or not at like the extremes of either end of that scat. 
um, the handler might choose to reward the dog into the DNA lab. You might have a lot of lab fees for an off-target species. So there's a lot of stuff that we can do as professionals to train our dogs appropriately for that and mitigate that as much as we can. Um, but that is a potential downside of dogs. And one of the things that is worrying in this field um, is because of how much it's growing right now, one of the things that I think we worry about a little bit is the idea of people just hearing a podcast like this and going out there and trying that with their dogs um, and, and then potentially making one of these errors that I'm describing and then it gets published or someone hears about it and decides that they never want to work with conservation dogs again. And it's actually just because someone didn't quite know what they were doing with training their dog. Um, the yeah. possibility of completely discrediting the field. Which exactly. Is so because powerful. it is such a, because it's such a new field. Like I think, I, and it's getting less tenuous. Um, mm. I would say like I'm coming into the field at a really, really good time as it's getting a lot more, um, a lot more understanding. People are more aware of it. There's tons and tons of papers published now kind of proving that dogs can do this sort of work and demonstrating time and time again that they can. Um, but particularly several years ago, that was a huge worry in the field. And, it, you know, it still is like it's 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 a new field. And as particularly, you know, and I'm aware that I continue to fulfill the stereotype. You know, I'm 27 years old. I'm five foot two. I'm blonde, blue eyed. I'm bubbly, whatever. And I like show up with my dogs and try to convince some like crotchety old postdocs that uh, they should pay me to help them find their data. And, you know, I think sometimes there's this perception of like, oh, it's just girls and their dogs. Mm. Like, you just want to go take your dog for a hike. And like, that's not it at all. Like, we are trained professionals. We have dedicated our lives. You know, like almost everything in the life has like culminated <laughs> in, in this. this. But, you know, like we are kind of constantly battling that perception um, mm. in this field particularly because again it is uh, there's a lot a lot of the big players in this field are you know we're we're young women and uh, even the ones who are older you know the, the like the the pioneers over at working dogs for conservation the founders there have been doing this work for over 20 years so they're obviously not 27 anymore but um and they've gained a lot of credibility but you know i mean it's one of the reasons that i've thought about going to get a phd um is just to <laughs> have some oomph behind myself to be like no i'm not just kayla frat out here playing with her dogs like i know my shit like we just keep we doing what you're doing girl. you yeah. don't need that phd you just need to keep doing what you're doing because i thought the yeah. exact same thing but more letters behind our name doesn't necessarily mean that we're any less qualified than we currently are. So mm -hmm. I, but yeah. I, I, I understand that exact battle that you are currently facing. Yeah. Cause I've thought about it a hell of a lot. Um, yep. but you're freaking awesome. You know, your shit. So mm -hmm. I don't think you need a PhD, but I mean, do what you want, do what you want. Yeah, we got some PhD right friends. <laughs> we sure do. Yeah, we don't so. hate all of our PhD friends. We no, love we don't at all. Much. I love most of them. Cause most of them say the exact same thing about being like having a PhD and going yeah, into academia. That is the funny thing. Which is interesting. A lot of them are just like, mm, Maybe make don't. sure you're going into it for the right reason. So I was like, that's good advice. So, but yeah. No. Have you run into that a lot? Uh, which part like people telling me not to go get a phd um no not that part that's me um uh. about <laughs> no about just um i don't know if sexism is the right word but kind of just judging you skepticism for, yeah for kind yeah. of who you are and just not maybe accepting you or taking you as seriously as they should as you being yeah. a woman professional yeah i think i think particularly and i I generally tend to blame it on my age more than my sex. Um, and mm. I'm not, I mean, I don't necessarily know. Like I haven't asked people like, why don't you want to work with me? Um, but I generally <laughs> assume survey. it's that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Please take the survey as to why you don't want to hire me. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the good thing for me where I'm at in my career right now is because I do have enough skills as a communicator um, and enough uh, kind of background and education in that area. Most of my clientele are either at this point come from personal connections or from kind of people reaching out to me and asking if they could work with me versus me putting out a lot of bids um, for projects. I That probably is going to change in the next year or so, but where I'm at right now, I've been getting enough coming in. So I haven't had to deal with it as much as I think um, I was worried I would. Mm. Well, that's good to hear. Um, 
yeah at least for I mean, now. honestly i mean it's hard to say like i don't know how many people maybe start thro- scrolling through my website and then realize that it's just me and then choose not to send me an email you know like i i, I can't know about those people mm. yeah that's a really good point so fingers crossed I mean, yeah, you yeah have... I mean, hopefully it's just not a problem. Like, hopefully, mm-hmm. I mean, so far, it seems like it hasn't been the, the biggest problem is generally funding and trying to or or getting buy in for permits. Like sometimes that's where we can run into problems where um, like as I'm working on on this hopeful Ecuador project, you know, trying to figure out how to convince the Ecuadorian government to let us fly dogs into the country, which, you know, we can get the dogs into the country, but then how do we get permits to go do this sort of work? And then, mm-hmm. you know, it's, and then it's just, you know, normal red tape of like, yeah, we'd like to move Jaguar scat around and like, it has nothing to do with the dogs. It's just annoying permit stuff. <laughs> right. It's normal government, mm-hmm. international. Yeah. Well, it's not even international, just government stuff and how annoying that can be. Yeah. yeah, Talk about red tape. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. And and that's uh, a lot of times there. uh, You know, I'm also kind of strategic about my partners as I'm applying for these sorts of things um, and, you know, might put their names first. (laughs) Just, Mm. you know, just to be strategic, you know, and I might be being paranoid about it, but I'd rather I'd rather be a little bit paranoid about it and not have my name first than to not get something because you know, they do a quick Google and realize that I'm, you know, so young and Mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. A woman. Especially when it comes to international stuff, just yeah, yeah, I've been all over the world and being a woman uh just is what it is. I mean, it just is what it is. So we got to do what we got to do. And hopefully it'll keep changing as more voices get out there. And we're just like, hell no, we are great professionals. And Listen to me do my thing and, you know, yeah. but we'll I, get there. I fought my way up here because I'm tooth and nail. So, <laughs> like, exactly. trust me, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I, <laughs> no one would let me do this if I did not. <laughs> exactly. So on that note, what exactly is a day in this job? What does that mm. mean for you and for your dog? Yeah. Um, so like a lot of field biology, it is an early morning most days. <laughs> So, you know, we're generally we're trying to get up and get where we're going. Um, If we're doing summer field work in particular, we're trying to be ready to get out of the trucks and get to work as the sun is rising. And that's because dogs just don't deal with heat quite as well as people do. So even on those days where I'm hot as heck, my dog is going to be much hotter Mm. um, because I can sweat. And my dog doesn't. Um, and panting really heavily reduces your dog's ability to scent because then they're obviously breathing through their mouth, um, and they're cooling using the, their surface area of their tongue. Um, so they can't smell as well. So we don't want our dogs to be super duper hot, obviously both for like heat stroke reasons, but also just for like efficacy reasons. So it's really, 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 really early mornings a lot of the time, because, you know, you might be like getting up, taking care of the dogs, making breakfast, commuting to the field site, getting out of the truck we're in the headlamps, you know, like getting ready. And then you're actually going out and hitting, hitting the trail. So a lot of times, um, for an actual search, you're either walking like a trail or a road, um, kind of in like a a triangle or whatever it is, or you've actually got a search area that you're gritting out and you're kind of walking transects through that. So those are kind of the two main ways that that will go about. If we're doing more of the transect, um, route, which is the, typical route i'll usually have something that's been sent to me as a gps file that's you know some weird like hexagon that i have to search (laughs) um or just like like once i had to search an area like a plot that was like shaped like the letter e and i was just like how how am i supposed to walk this effectively like i'm supposed to be walking like uh transects that are spaced 100 meters apart and like there's just no good way for me to do this. It just took like three times as long as it showed up for how many acres it was. And that's fine. I get paid for it. I like being out with my dogs. I was just hot and tired at the end. Um, yeah. Like, God damn it. Why is this not a rectangle? Duh. Yeah. Oh my God. Rectangles are so nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that was actually, that was a black footed ferret project. So the, oh. the, the shape that I was working on was actually based on where the prairie dogs were. Um, oh. Because the, the, you know, like there's no point in searching where prairie the prairie dogs, dogs aren't. And yeah, the prairie dog towns turns out are not built on a grid. They you don't need to. Yeah, <laughs> they are like they need to get up to the 21st century prairie dogs. Um, <laughs> so yeah, and then we're out. Um, and then my job is I am like keeping. I have I have like 17 eyes, 
because I'm keeping one eye on my GPS to make sure we're walking in a straight line and we're keeping our transect the right distance apart from our other transects. I'm watching the ground to make sure there's no like, I mean, obviously like giant potholes that I'm going to step in and break my ankle right or <laughs> not snakes or ground nesting birds that I don't want to step on or whatever it is. Like I'm always finding crazy stuff that it's like, well, good thing I didn't step on that. Um, and then I'm also watching my dog and making sure. So basically as we're out, my dog is generally working off leash. I have dogs that are really reliable off leash and don't tend to chase wildlife. Um, if we're in an environment, so like in those prairie dog towns, for example, I might have the dog on leash instead, just because like it is so tempting even for the best dog in the world to go chase all those prairie dogs. Cause mm. you're literally just like walking past like screaming prairie <laughs> dogs that are 10 meters away. Um, and your Understandable. Dog is like, mm, I really, really, really want to do this. Like, it's just like, it's not a fair thing to ask your dog to be able to not chase the prairie dogs. <laughs> Um, so there the dog might be off, off on a leash. Um, and there I have like a 30 foot leash so that my dog is still able to like search and move pretty freely. And then I'm watching for, as my dog catches odor, I'll usually start to see his nose raise up and down or his tail wag changes. So Barley in particular, when he's searching, he kind of has this really cute periscope tail that goes like up and over his back. And it's just kind of like wag, 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 wag. Um, as he gets tired, it might drop a little bit, but it's usually pretty <laughs> high. And then once he catches odor, you'll actually see his tail wag totally change. And like, it'll start wagging harder and faster. And you can see him starting to get excited where he's like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm finding the thing. Oh my God, I'm going to get my ball. Um, <laughs> so I'm watching for that because if I start seeing those changes in behavior, then I want to make sure that I'm supporting him through that and following him wherever he's going. Because again, he might've caught odor from something that's like 40 meters away so I need to make sure that I'm going to follow him and like support him through that I know I keep saying the word support but it's basically like if I just kept walking where I was like nope I'm on my transect he might kind of start following that odor and then like look over his shoulder and be like oh my person's not coming okay I guess I'll come with you and like through training we do try to teach the dogs like no 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 listen to the odor the handler is stupid we don't know anything like follow the odor we will catch up um, but also, you know, I can make my dog, my dog's job easier by just, you know, if he's Falling. like taking off like a shot in a given direction, I, like I, I, he's probably after something and it's probably what we want to be finding. So then I'll go find him. Once we find our sample, then, you know, we follow whatever those collection protocols are for, are for the study. So, you know, if it's an invasive plant, I'm probably just marking it and flagging it, marking it on my GBS. Um, if it's scat, then I've probably got a backpack full of stuff where I'm collecting however, you know, samples, however they want to be collected. I might have a giant cooler in my backpack for all that. Oh um, yeah, it's a lot of gear. It's yes. a lot of gear. <laughs> uh, then we do give the dog a nice water break. We give the dog a nice play session. And then we start again and we head off again, just and kind of do that until we're done. Mm. Long days. Yeah sounds like long days and then yeah well and then like the, the dogs generally will work like four hours at a time and then we get back to the car um we go home a lot of times i have more than one dog with me in the field so then i'm exhausted but i put the working dog down for a nap and then i have to go take the other dog out and exercise them <laughs> <laughs> so um it's a lot it's a lot a lot of work um and then at some point i usually do have to deal with like email um and those sorts of things and then i also need to like shower and eat the human um, stuff of this job. Yeah, usually I have to stretch. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Hiking on the side of a mountain or whatever else, wherever yeah, else the yeah, site is. Yeah, do laundry because my socks smell like I've been wearing them for a month because <laughs> maybe I have been. Uh, yeah, and then a lot of times in the evening, I'll also go out and kind of prep my search area for the next day. So if at mm. all possible. So a lot of times our search areas are near enough a road that I can actually, um, well, not a lot of times, but sometimes they are. I can actually go out and place um, a couple gimmies for my dog. So particularly if we're working in an environment where we know the dog is not likely to find much. So if we're like mm. those black-footed ferret surveys, for example, it's pretty likely that the dog will actually go a couple days at a time without finding a ferret. So we will actually have samples of um, <laughs> ferret bits or ferret scat that we can go out and pre-place the night before so that when we're working the next day, the dog has something that they can go and find and get rewarded for, which mm. helps keep their motivation up. Um, and I also might pre-place out like a cooler with some ice bottles and a cooling coat for my dog so that as we're kind of partway through the search, we can actually just like give the dog a nice ice bath and cool them down, hang out in the shade for a little bit and get them ready to go for, for the rest of the search. 
um, because we, we really do have to be very careful about heat stroke. One of the tough things with working dogs is when you select for these dogs that are just like over the top obsessed with toys and over the top obsessed with the work, they won't necessarily stop mm. if they're tired. They won't necessarily stop if they're in danger of overheating. They won't necessarily take care of themselves. So it's like also partially my job because we selected these dogs that are like pathologically obsessed with toys. It's my job to make sure to keep them safe and like do that for them and, you know, kind of uh, use my prefrontal cortex and my primate brain when like they're, they're just not capable of it because they're so obsessed with the work. Mm. Yeah. Does not sound like an easy job. I mean, I don't know a job in conservation that is easy, but that one sounds particularly <laughs> long days, long days, long, hard long days, days in the field. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, but it is, I mean, like, gosh, I love the sunrise. I love, love, oh, love yes, watching yes, yes. the sunrise. And like, I love just getting to be out there alone with my dog. Um, I love all the like weird little fi things I find on the ground. Cause I'm just like, I'm walking transects. I'm not on trails. I'm just like out in the middle of nowhere. Just being like, huh. Like I once came up on a ground. <laughs> I found so many ground nesting birds um, during a couple transects, wow. which was just incredible. Um, and I came up on one nest, and there was a snake in the nest with a with an egg halfway down its mouth. No I was way! Just like, what? <laughs> like this is so cool. <laughs> yeah, I just oh, it's it's like I love it, and and like even when it like it sucks, like most of the time the dog is still having fun. So at least you can still like look at the dog and be like, well, this is nice. Yeah. It's like, at least it's not just me pitching in the field. <laughs> at least one of us is enjoying this at this point. One of us is having fun. Yeah. And then, yeah, like, obviously the times where the dog isn't having fun is just like, okay, it's a bad day. Yeah, <laughs> like, we, need we just home. need to go. <laughs> we can just, we can finish this transect tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And, and you've kind of mentioned some things, but this is a question I'd love to ask all, all my guests that come on just to help normalize the field. But what would you say has been your biggest struggle so far or one that you're currently experiencing mm -hmm. and how did you get over it or how are you currently trying to work through it? I think for me, the biggest thing I'm worried about long-term in this field is just how ridiculously transient the lifestyle is. Um, because I don't necessarily have like a study species or a study area, at least right now, like I, my, this summer, I'm going to be in Nebraska, um, Barley and Niffler and I are finding dead bats on wind farms. And then I have no idea what we're doing over the winter. Um, we don't have a job lined up yet. Um, we might just kind of coast and work off of my dog training business income. Cause I also have a dog training business. <laughs> um, uh, or we might, you know, we might be able to find some work. I haven't found anything quite yet. And then this coming spring, so spring 2022, we're hopefully going to be in the Southeast doing some reptile, um, searches. And then I'm applying for that grant to go down to Ecuador and do big cat work in Ecuador. Um, <laughs> So it's a lot of travel. It's a lot of kind of constantly applying for jobs, constantly applying for grants. Like I don't have like a stable income or housing situation. Um, and right now I am single and transient and that's cool with me. But at some point, like I do want to buy a house and find my person and like settle in a little bit more. And I, and it's going to be interesting to see how this this job may evolve for me as, as that becomes something that I do. So right now I literally live out of a sprinter van that I can just drive to my field site. So I don't have to pay for field housing and I don't have to, you know, cook microwave meals in a hotel, um, for months at end. Um, cause that was something that I had to do last year that, you know, it gets tiring. Like even with a good housing and food stipend, like it sucks to have to eat out of, uh, out of a microwave every night or like take your camp stove out and cook in the parking lot, <laughs> which is something I did a lot too. <laughs> now I have like a cute, you know, I'm, I'm living van life, which is really, really great. Um, but yeah, like I do worry long-term about kind of like loneliness and like that level of transience. Um, there are other people in this field. So like, um, conservation dogs collective is based out of the Midwest and most of their handlers actually primarily work jobs that are, that are close to home. Um, so jobs where they, uh, they're able to see their loved ones pretty frequently, they might even just be commuting from home. Um, and they tend to have these longer term projects. So I think ultimately that's going to be a goal for me where I might have more of a home base and I more have like a couple long-term projects that I work with in my area. And maybe, yeah, occasionally I go take like a month or six weeks or eight weeks to go do like another project somewhere interesting. Not that wherever I'm living isn't going to be interesting, but somewhere different. <laughs> 
um, versus what I'm doing right now, which is just that I'm just like, I literally don't know where I'm going to be living on October 4th, 2021. Like, I, I have no idea. And like, that's fine for me right now, but I know it won't be at some point. Mm, absolutely. So would you say that that is your ultimate goal stability or, or to you, what is, what is your ultimate goal for canine conservationists or you in your career? When will you feel that you've made it and whatever that sense is for you? Ooh. Oh gosh, <laughs> that is such a good question. I feel like I, I should know the answer to that. And I don't think I do quite yet. Um, I am. <sighs> I'm really passionate about kind of growing this field. Like I think while I really love the field work for sure right now, again, I know that like long-term that field work, the field work schedule that I'm planning on for the next couple of years is not going to be sustainable for me at some point. Like at some point, again, I want to like live somewhere and have a person that I live with. Um, and I think one of the aspects of this, this field that I am really excited about trying to help grow would be starting more programs um, I had around the world. Like part of why conservation dogs are not sustainable financially in a lot of places is because what they're looking at is the cost of hiring someone like me, flying them wherever they are, paying my daily rate, paying for my housing, blah, 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 blah. It gets really expensive. Um, but I think that conservation dogs as like a dog that lives at a field station and can be used for those projects by given biologists is something that could be done more. There are some programs that do this already, but that's something that I think I'd be really interested in getting more involved with is like helping train dogs where it's like, okay, at this, at this particular research station, we know we have this, these species that we're really interested in. Can we have a dog that is more or less a resident, you know, a staff biologist mm -hmm. dog <laughs> who, mm -hmm. who lives there to, to help with that. Um, and that's just a really good way to cut costs and also get more people on the ground in, involved in it. Because one of the things that I'm a little uncomfortable with, and I don't do as much of the international travel as um, some other companies do, at least not yet. Again, I'm brand new in this. Like I've been doing this for six months. Um, but it always feels a little bit weird to be like the white person showing up and like teaching every like doing the thing, doing the fun part of the job and then just leaving. Like I would, I would be much more interested in kind of helping get more of these programs off the ground in a really sustainable way. Um, again, around the U S or around the world. Uh -huh. Oh my gosh, let's make this happen. That sounds yeah. amazing. Cause the only time yeah. like before you, um, and some other, you know, conservation that I met in the field, the first time I was exposed to a conservation dog, a conservation scat dog specifically was at the cheetah conservation fund in Namibia. So that's the first time that I even had my eyes open to like, holy shit, you can use dogs to go smell cheetah poop. Like, yeah. That's fucking genius. Like, why did, why am I just now learning this? And this was in two, like 2016 and that program had already been up for a couple years. So, and I mean, and just the power of that program was amazing. Yeah. And they had a genetics lab right there on site. So they were able to identify oh God, immediately if this was a cheetah or not, which again, that's a whole different conversation that you and I have already talked about because it could be a leopard and blah, 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 blah. Um, but assuming it is cheetah, who that cheetah is and because they know all the cheetahs there and then the the health of it, you know, hormones, pregnancy, not healthy, you know, all those cool. type of things. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So I... I mean, having seen those dogs firsthand around the world, I can completely see why that would be an, an amazing, oh, what's the word I'm even looking for? Just like initiative for you mm -hmm. to like really just try to get them out in the field um, as more and more people are exposed to the idea of using dogs in conservation. Um, yeah, heck yeah. Hopefully someone listening can like really help with that idea. Um, yeah, I'll keep, yeah, I'll yeah, keep yeah, shouting yeah. it. <laughs> Yeah. I'll keep shouting it to the rooftops for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so is there any, it's from in your field, you've gone through, you've been through so much. You've gone through so many things, um, taking the whole roller coaster of life so mm -hmm. far. What's your biggest piece of advice to anyone listening and whatever you think that they need to hear? I think the biggest thing is if you really know what you want to do or you think you know, because obviously you can always change your mind. It, it like tenacity with it and like you don't have to go 
the path that someone else went, you know, like for me, what worked was being like, well, fine, I'm going to go to grad school to prove that I'm hireable. And then I eventually just got hired before I went to grad school. Like, okay. You know, I thought that grad school was going to be the ticket in a way it was because I got the job offer because I was applying. Um, but you know, it's not the path that I expected at all. And like, I was initially really discouraged. I used to joke with my ex a little bit. This always hurt his feelings, but you know, that initial email that I had gotten that said, no, we don't really hire people who are in committed relationships because they end up having to choose between their partner and their job. I used to joke with, with my ex, with Andrew, like, yeah, well, you know, I'll just be a conservation dog handler when we break up. And he would always be like, when we break up? <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, I'd be like, oh, no, no, no. Like, I'm just, you know, like, it's my backup plan. Like, I can have my dream job or I can date you. Like, it's just one of the two. And I, like, joked about that with him, which was not very sensitive of me. And I apologize. <laughs> um, and I ended up getting hired by working dogs for conservation while he and I were still together. We broke up unrelated to the job, actually. Um, but, um you know, like I, I could have just taken that advice and been like, okay, well, I guess I'll never be a conservation dog handler or, okay, I guess I have to break up with my boyfriend in order to have this job. And like, neither of those was true. Um, I, I, like I do, as I've been dating around now, like I have to think about my lifestyle and my lifestyle is a hurdle for people that I might want to date. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, that it doesn't have to stop things and that, you know, like uh, eventually my lifestyle will probably change. So anyway, advice for people like tenacity and creativity and like building those relationships, like for me, when I got hired by working dogs for conservation, basically because I came to them asking, Hey, what are the problems that you guys need help solving? And I'm going to pursue my own funding and not need anything from you. And I'm going to go figure out how to solve these things. So then when they were deciding to hire, like, of course I was someone that they thought of, you know, letting them know that they had an open position because I didn't just send them a cold email asking for a job, which will, which is what I had done several years earlier. I'm sure I emailed working dogs for conservation back when I was an undergrad <laughs> and they were probably one of the eight people places that didn't respond to me. So I don't remember ever having contact with them previously. Um, you know, so rather than like shotgunning out those emails, just being like, Oh my God, I want to do this. And I get those emails all the time already in this field. And like, I try really hard to respond to people and tell people, you know, I meet with them, do whatever I can to help them talk about and learn about this field. But like, the reality is I, I like, unless I, I don't have time for just like endless mentoring and I don't have funding to hire anyone. I'm sure most of the people reaching out to me are incredibly um, talented and worthy of being hired, but like I barely pay myself. Um, so, you know, figuring out other ways to get your foot in the door. Mm. Um, and that, you know, and that goes for everything, not just conservation dog stuff, of course. That's really good advice. I will say there's one thing about this field is you have to get creative. It's, mm -hmm. you can't just, it's, I think maybe because um, other fields are this way, that there's like very much a ladder that you follow in other career paths. And growing up, we are, I don't know if blinded is the right word, but we are just influenced that that is the path that we need to go down. There's a very specific way that you go through your career. And yeah. I don't know one person in conservation where that's actually happened in any way, shape or form. Even some of my PhD friends were like, I mean, life took a left turn after they graduated. And they're like, I don't want to be a professor. So what the hell do I do now? They come, they find a completely oh. different path. Um, so yes, it's not going to, <laughs> One thing's for sure, it's not going to be how you plan it, and it's going to go completely how you don't expect, <laughs> which is perfectly yeah. fine. I just yeah. got to ride the waves. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. So what's the best way for anybody to connect with you? Or mm -hmm. I know we really didn't get much into your professional dog training side. We really sit on the conservation mm -hmm. side, but... Um, you have this amazing blog that people definitely need to check out because uh, yeah. you have so many freaking resources online. And is it even funny? Um, so many, so many, so many. It's amazing. Um, but yeah, how can people connect with you, find your stuff, um, want to chat with you, all those things? Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the biggest, most relevant way for listeners here is canineconservationists.org. So it's letter K number nine, conservationists. Um, that should link to all of our social media as well. So we've got a TikTok, which has the same name. 
We've got an Instagram, which is currently Collies Without Borders. I'm trying to change the name to Canine Conservationists, and Instagram isn't letting me for some reason. Just dumb, whatever. Instagram algorithm stuff thinks that I'm doing something naughty. <laughs> um, I do have a Facebook, but I actually prefer to keep my personal Facebook private. So um, I try to make it hard for people to find me there. And if you try to friend me on Facebook, I will not add you back. Um, <laughs> so follow me on Instagram or TikTok instead. Um, Canine Conservationist does have a Facebook page. So if Facebook is your preferred social media, you can find us there. Um, then for Journey Dog Training, which is my dog training site, um, which honestly basically funds my life right now in Canine Conservationist is like a side project that I'm really trying to make into a job. Um, journey dog training is at journeydogtraining.com. And as you said, we've got all sorts of like blogs and podcasts and just like endless free and low cost resources for like any dog behavior problem you could ever be experiencing. Basically it's, it's kind of insane. Um, sometimes I like go through it and I'm like, did I, did I write that? Who did this? <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't remember this. Um, and then the podcast. So if you're interested in more conservation dog stuff or even just kind of conservation stuff in particular, it's a canine conservationist podcast. We cover everything um, from like more kind of hard, hard ecology and conservation biology over to like pretty dog specific stuff. So I think people will enjoy that as well um, if they enjoyed this talk. Absolutely. And I'll make sure. I think that's all of it. I, think, I, I, think very, good. I am very easy to find on the internet. Like I will say that. Like I, I am a very prolific writer and podcaster, and like I have a YouTube channel that's mostly dog training and like some van life stuff. Um, oh, like yeah, you, <laughs> just, whatever your preferred method of social media is, like I, I'm probably there. <laughs> And if not there, you're on this next one right beside it. So and yeah, I'll exactly. make sure. like, I'm not on Clubhouse yet. I'm sorry, but I am on, I've got a podcast. So like tough luck. Yeah, <laughs> that's the one place. Oh, that's awesome. And if anybody yeah. reaches out, of course, I'll 100% yes. they get in contact with you and I'll make sure all of your connection stuff is in the show notes as well. So yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm always happy to talk, you know, like I did, mm -hmm. I do get a lot of contacts and I, I don't always get back to you right away, but I generally get to people within a couple of days. So. Nice. Awesome. Well, Just be patient. Thanks so much, Kayla. This has been yeah. oh my gosh, thank so you so much. So fun. much. I cannot wait to release this episode and get it out to the world. Yeah, I'm so excited to uh, <laughs> to hear it and uh, yeah, go share it around. So awesome. thank you so much. And um, yeah, but you, you're doing really incredible work with this podcast. I absolutely love it. So oh, yeah, thanks for having best. me. So glad to have you in my friend circle now. <laughs> <laughs> hey thanks again for listening to this episode of rewildology if you like what you heard hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode do you have a cool environmental organization travel story or research that you'd like to share let me know at rewildology.com until next time friends together we will rewild the planet <laughs>